some of the slides that I'll present uh, actually reflect on the fact that South Australia in many respects is leading the response to hepatitis B in Australia, both from a community perspective and clinical perspectives, um, and now strategically uh, with the release of the action plan. Hepatitis B as a global health priority is a very, very significant issue. And that's been something that's been quite hard to quantify for some time. The best estimates we've got are that around 350 million people worldwide are living with chronic hepatitis B. For people living with chronic hepatitis B, and I think there's two ways to look at this. First of all, 75% of people living with chronic hepatitis B will actually never develop complications of hepatitis B, will not have ongoing liver disease. And I think that's one of the important messages to make, that someone who's diagnosed as an individual with hepatitis B, that most of those people will live uh, healthy lives and require no particular intervention other than monitoring. But up to 25% of people living with hepatitis B will develop those complications, including cirrhosis and liver cancer. So what about here in Australia? Well, the most up-to-date and methodologically rigorous estimate to develop a sense of the number of people affected estimate around 220,000 Australians are living with chronic hepatitis B. Liver cancer is now the fastest increasing cause of cancer death in this country. 99% of the morbidity and mortality of hepatitis B in this country is from chronic hepatitis B, not from acute hepatitis B. In recognition of the fact that this has been something that Australia as a whole, and in fact the world as a whole, has not been addressing in a systematic fashion, there has been the development of strategic responses over the last few years, including the WHO here. This was published in 2012 following the Viral Hepatitis Resolution of 2010. The National Hepatitis B Strategy, which um, was ratified by all of the states and territories of the Federation back in 2010. And then most recently here, the uh, Hepatitis B Action Plan in South Australia. The vast majority of people living with chronic hepatitis B here in Australia were infected at birth or early in life. And the two main groups that that's applicable to in Australia are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and people born overseas in endemic areas with hepatitis B. And that's because if you're exposed to hepatitis B at birth, you have a 90% chance of going on to developing chronic infection. There are other priority populations mentioned in both the national strategy and in the action plan beyond those two groups. And they include men who have sex with men and people who inject drugs and other groups who are at higher risk. You can see that people born in Asia, the Asia Pacific region, so our own Asia Pacific region, are the single greatest proportion of people living with hepatitis B in Australia. But if you come around here, you can see the majority of people were born overseas. However, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people represent approximately 9 to 10% of people living with hepatitis B in Australia. And from the 2011 census, it was recorded that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people represent approximately 2.6% of the Australian population. So you can see they're disproportionately represented amongst people living with chronic hepatitis B. Liver disease uh, amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has been estimated to represent approximately 11% of the life expectancy gap attributable to chronic disease. Clearly that's not all just hepatitis B. Uh, in some contexts and populations, hepatitis C is also important, uh, and diabetes and, and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, fatty liver, and also alcohol um, can contribute to the burden of liver disease. A fundamental determinant of our collective response to hepatitis B and what might change that is engaging with these affected communities and supporting the affected communities to actually take leadership in this space and to drive the response based on the needs as assessed by them. It's been central to our response to HIV and also to hepatitis C that the affected community are partners at the table and are driving both policy responses, health priorities and also to a degree and especially in HIV the, the body of research that's being done in, uh, in, in this space. For hepatitis B, that is just simply not happening. So a situation analysis which was funded by the federal government and conducted by the Australian Research Centre for Sex, Health and Society, and particularly Jack Wallace with some of the partners, looked at this issue in the Torres Strait and went up to the Torres Strait and spoke to clinicians and spoke to community members and actually tried to get a bit of a scoping exercise. And I think the lessons that came out of that are something that has been replicated when similar projects were done in, in Queensland and particularly far north Queensland by Annie Preston Thomas. And for people working in uh, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations that are starting to try and take hepatitis B into the, the body of work, there are some really common messages that come through. There are clearly knowledge gaps and, and where there's been a lack of training and a lack of focus, it's inevitable that there will be knowledge gaps in the healthcare workers. What they found in the Torres Strait is that they developed a systematic testing protocol, which is obviously a fantastic first step, but then they were stuck because they identified a substantial proportion of people living with hepatitis B but didn't know what to do then. Um, how do you then respond to the needs of those people? What sort of downstream testing do you need and how often? Who needs liver cancer surveillance and how are you going to achieve that in a remote area? And how do we start thinking about putting people on antiviral therapy, which for many people will be indefinite? A lot of, a lot of questions.
um, one of the answers that was recommended was um, the development of models of care and actually something that would again translate beyond the Torres Strait, S practical ways to support the workers in these uh, organisations to start thinking about hepatitis B and incorporating it into their work. There's a strong argument that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be tested for hepatitis B and if they remain susceptible to be vaccinated. And one of the few states that actually systematically funds that is South Australia. Certainly Victoria doesn't, New South Wales doesn't. The evidence suggests that is an absolute best buy from a public health level, but um, a lot of our jurisdictions don't do it. South Australia does. So how do we improve primary prevention? And clearly, even though the burden of chronic hepatitis B is not going to be addressed predominantly by vaccination here in Australia, acute hepatitis B itself has a substantial health burden. Uh, it's probably about 10% of acute infections are actually diagnosed or notified. It still remains one of the, the top three causes of vaccine preventable death in Australia is hepatitis B. And apart from people who die, there's a number of liver transplants that occur every year. Um, one liver transplant buys a hell of a lot of hep B vaccine. South Australia, the populations included in the free vaccination program is the closest of any jurisdiction in the country to what the recommendations are in the Australian Immunisation Handbook. Uh, as I've mentioned, in Victoria and in New South Wales, adults who, are, who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander are not eligible for vaccine even if they're susceptible, funded by the state. It's not included. Um, in many jurisdictions, uh, the <coughs> humanitarian and uh, asylum seeker, so uh, humanitarian entrants, are not offered routine vaccination funded by the state for hepatitis B. It is uh, without a shade of doubt, but with a certain amount of shame that I say that we really, the rest of the country can really learn from um, how South Australia looks at the hep B vaccination policy and really thinks about the long, the downstream impact of this, that really having a systematic way of protecting people from getting hepatitis B down the track is going to relate to not it's been estimated uh, on a, in populations, even with a prevalence like ours in Australia, that this sort of thing not only is cost effective, but cost saving to society. You actually get more money back in reducing the downstream outcomes of this than you actually invest in the vaccination program. When we look at the number of people who are estimated to be living with Hep B in Australia, and then compare that to the number of people who have ever been diagnosed with Hepatitis B, we estimate that only just over half of the people living with Hep B in Australia actually know anything about it. 44% of people living with Hep B here in Australia have never been tested, have not been diagnosed and have no idea that they've got chronic Hepatitis B. And that's why there's a not insignificant proportion of people whose diagnosis of hep Hepatitis B is actually made after they present with liver cancer. And that's a disaster for a disease which has a long lead time, you know, decades usually, and that people have been living in a country with a resources like Australia and that people, particularly um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people born overseas in endemic areas have been recommended in the literature, including in, in primary care uh, publications since the early 1990s to be systematically tested for Hep B. The fact that people are still presenting with liver cancer and dying often within a month of presentation when they've been living with that risk factor, a $15 blood test, which is Medicare rebatable, $15. Um, it's actually, it's a human rights issue. It's not a health service issue. It's not a systems issue. That's a human rights issue. So who is recommended for testing? This is a big list. These are the people who are recommended both uh, in our new national hepatitis B testing policy. This is a website we set up to help primary care clinicians in their testing and management, initial management of hepatitis B. So it's a long list. It's important to remember that two thirds of people living with chronic hepatitis B in Australia are people born overseas in endemic areas and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So those two groups represent at least two thirds of all people living with chronic Hep B. So what's the evidence that it's actually cost effective to do that? You know, clinical interactions cost money, blood tests cost money. Is this actually, a, from a population health level, a cost effective thing to do? Well, over in the USA, the CDC thinks it is. In Europe, they think it is. As I said at the start, it is a really stark reminder that liver cancer is now the fastest increasing cause of cancer death in Australia. That's not all Hep B, it's multifactorial. Hep C obviously driving a lot of that as well. Viral hepatitis together represents the vast majority of, of liver cancer being diagnosed here in Australia and a lot of that rise. From a global perspective, it's the third most common cause of cancer death in the world is liver cancer and 60 to 80% of that's from Hep B. So Australia understandably has been investing significant resources from a, from a community level on approach to cancer and we've been succeeding. So these are New South Wales data. You can see that for many cancers, the, uh, the change in mortality in 1999 to 2008 was very substantial in the right direction. The standout exception here is liver cancer. 
which increased 50 to 100% in those 10 years, the mortality from liver cancer. And this is replicated in Victoria and no doubt here in South Australia as well. That whereas we are succeeding with many of those other cancers, this is now one of the top 10 cancers, as I said, and we're going backwards. What about improving clinical management? What do we need to do in this space to try and convert people from getting asymptomatic progressive liver disease resulting in these horrible outcomes, and how do we shift that into people being appropriately monitored and treated when they need it? What evidence is there that by increasing access to treatment, we're actually gonna make a difference to these outcomes? For a long time, what we were relying on is things like, oh yes, well, we brought down the viral load, so isn't that great? Or, oh yeah, e-antigen seroconversion, that's fantastic. But what evidence is there that actually the stuff that matters to people, developing cancer, dying, getting sick, that the treatments we've got available today actually make a difference there. Well, there is substantially increasing evidence that hepatitis B treatment is a fantastic way to prevent cancer. So from purely from a cancer prevention point of view, increasing access to treatment for hepatitis B is one of the most cost effective ways of preventing cancer and a cancer that's the fastest increasing in our community. 218,000 people, this is of 2011, who have chronic hep B, we've diagnosed just over half of them. We have no idea what proportion have been properly engaged, given appropriate information, ability to make choices. We have no idea what proportion are receiving appropriate primary care and management and monitoring. We have no idea what proportion are actually making it through to specialist services, or once they're there, are receiving appropriate care and monitoring. What we do know is that of November 2011, and again, the data are a little bit dodgy, but this is the best we've got, only about 3% of people living with hep B in the country are on treatment. The most conservative estimates for the number of people or the proportion of people living with hep B who need to be on treatment is about 15%. The most conservative estimates. So that means 80% of people in Australia currently needing treatment of hep B are not getting it. There's a lot of uh, areas where we need to improve and one of the things we really need to get that improvement is strategic responses both on a national level and on a jurisdictional level and not just to have the strategies but to actually implement them. The evidence is clear that antiviral treatment is well tolerated. It substantially affects the natural history of hep B and prevents liver cancer in a short period of time and is extremely well tolerated. We need to increase access. There's just no argument that this has to be done. And so we need to do that, and particularly those two elements that are in the national strategy and in your action plan, engaging the affected communities and, 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 and informing them and empowering them to actually come forward and be a partner at the table here. You know, the evidence is there that this is an emerging public health priority for Australia. The evidence is there that there are things we can do cost effectively from a healthcare perspective to actually turn around what is one of the fundamental drivers of the fastest increasing cause of uh, cancer death in our community. So in conclusion, this is a significant public health issue. The burden of hepatitis B is disproportionately prevalent or invested in communities who are subject to broader healthcare inequity uh, here in Australia particularly. Failure to engage people in this issue from those affected communities and failure to diagnose them is disastrous. Failure to prevent is unacceptable and continuing to be satisfied with only 20% of people who need treatment to prevent liver cancer, to be satisfied with that as a response from all of us I think is completely, it's unconscionable. We just can't allow that to happen. So we need to increase access to diagnosis and care and to information and that these are all mandated in the national strategy and now mandated in your action plan as well.